But what I'd like to do is uh, introduce a, a, a very uh, I think distinguished panel and with uh, many different perspectives on the issue of uh, protecting and sharing data. And I'd just like to begin it with a, a sort of a framing of, of, of what, what I've seen is, is the issue evolve over a period of time. And that is, is that there traditionally has been thinking about a, a, a sort of a contest between privacy and security. You can't have both. And now I think the framing that I like in this conference is, is saying that this data, that we're collecting this a massive amount of data, and it has huge value. I mean, it can be used in a very, very positive way. Yes, it can be very identifying. Yes, it could be used in, in draconian ways. But I think it's, it's, it's a, the question is how do, how do we sort of square the circle or uh, how, how do we create new kinds of regulatory technical mechanisms whereby we can able to make use of the data at the same time uh, protect people's privacy. And I don't think they're opposite concepts at all. And so what I'd like to do is, is, is present to the, to the panel to sort of from, to look at this issue from that perspective and, and say, well now, okay, what, how do you, from your particular perspective, how do you frame the issue and how do you, and then in the second section, we'll get into how do we think about solutions. So what I'd like to do, you all have a, a, um, a, the bios on the panel, so I'd like to have them briefly introduce themselves and how they think about this project or this, this problem. And, and then when we're done with that, we'll, we'll go into another set of questions about how we would think of different solutions. And then from that, we'd like to open it up to the floor. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so maybe, so I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I'm um, Associate Director of Sensible City Lab. Uh, we organize the conference here uh, with the help of AT&T. And um, uh, a big program committee who you'll see on the program. Um, just to say a brief note about what's the opportunity. I think the reframing that you just referred to is a key thing. Um, so we all know that there's data coming out of objects today, not only people. So objects start to communicate. You know, they, We have sensors distributed in the environment. Each of us carries a computer in their pocket. Um, the networks that manage our cities are computerized for maybe for managing resources um, for their own management. So bandwidth allocation on a cell phone network, energy distribution on an energy network, transportation management on a transportation network. But these, if you want to call them nervous systems of our cities, the fact that they're computerized already generates a huge amount of data about what's happening in cities. A lot of it is in real time. If you combine this with information that the government has, um, about, that it collects uh, through the statistical uh, efforts, and the information that we could then bring into this based on our uh, usage of different digital technologies, uh, it's a really, it's a vast amount of information. It almost uh, dwarfs what happened so far, say, in Twitter or on Flickr, the kind of things that we're used to as, as a big explosion of personal, personal expression. And there is an opportunity there to open this data up, to let it come together and improve the life in our cities. Um, the, uh, you know, one analogy is almost looking at what happened on the internet when platforms opened up and anyone could create a mashup. You could take you know, a news event, put it on a map, and there you go, you have an app, and anyone can do it, and the strong ones survive and attract people. What can we do to let those mashups come to space and really offer innovative services to us in cities, which evolve very slowly? Now, the reason we focus on cities is because it's proven to, be to have become the dominant form of settlement. Last year was the first time in history that more than half the globe lived in cities. Uh, they grew to enormous scales recently. Um, and uh, there are economies of scale in cities where they consume less energy per capita, less road, um, um, less asphalt per capita, uh, wire length in terms of electricity distribution, et cetera. And they scale super linearly when it comes to innovation if you look at cities. So city size, you know, a city of 10 people would make one patent, city of 20 people would make more than two patents. There is a scale there in the coming together in the density. So cities have really become a, a sort of a locus. Um, and if we can understand them better, make life better in cities using this kind of recombination with digital information, there, there seems to be a very strong opportunity there. So given this background, this is what guides a lot of the research we do at Sensible City Lab, 
uh, clearly there was a there's a there's an issue of privacy, and um, you know we've looked at it in different ways. Um, one of the things that seems to emerge, and that's just a thought. Um, we've discussed this with uh, some of the tele uh, members of the telecommunications sector at the World Economic Forum uh, strategy session last week. Um, the idea of showing that there could be benefit to the public good in using this uh, type of data collected on the large networks. So just to put a question out there, what would the public think if, they, if a city issues a bid that lets AT&T compete with another telco on cleaning up our air? You can use the data of, you know, um, that's exchanged on the network maybe for another purpose, for managing bandwidth, bandwidth. You can process it and create a model of emission. Suddenly you don't have to put sensors everywhere. It's cheaper, it's scalable, you can do the same everywhere. Uh, so if, what would happen if the public understood that if we each chip in a bit of anonymized data, there's a potential to make our public environment better? Will that create a new dialogue of trust between the public and the big uh, utilities or the big uh, infrastructure networks in cities that will allow them to exchange uh, different types of information also in return to um, also for revenue making applications. So th this is a question I have. We know that governments are opening up. There is the data.org initiative by the, um, by the federal government. There is the, uh, there are, these things happen also locally in different cities. So these mashups that I mentioned earlier could become a form of self-governance in some way, if we want to look at it. If we write the own apps that help us manage our cities better, uh, that help us understand what is our impact on the environment, uh, uh, what, is, what is our relationship with the public transportation service, et cetera, we start to participate in the governance of the city in concert with the top-down management. So there's an opportunity for a greater, uh, a greater quality of living in that as well. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, Dorothy, I mean, I mean, sorry, but Ellen, um, the, that with, uh, with 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 this wonderful uh, possibilities of data, uh, why wouldn't um, and this is an AT and T's in a wonderful position to provide a lot of data. Uh, why isn't this is maybe something uh, that can happen really soon? So, uh, I first I'll apologize for not being Dorothy. I feel like I'm projecting a little aura of disappointment <laughs> around me today. <laughs> Everyone says I say, oh, I'm here in Dorothy's, and they're like, oh. They were very gracious, but she's sorry she couldn't come. She got, uh, had to stay in Washington today. Um, so uh, interesting that you framed the question that way. We really worked with the Sensible Cities Lab and MIT to, to put this conference on because what we see is there's been a lot of public conversation about data use for commercial purposes. We've uh, worked with a lot of privacy advocates and industry organizations and, in our view, made considerable progress on what ought to be kind of the rules of the road for using customer data for commercial purposes. That work is obviously not done. We continue to work on it. There will be legislation introduced. The FTC continues to work. There's uh, been a lot of talk today about how the rules are old, the laws and regulations are old, and they don't really apply. And so the conversation about that for commercial uses of the data is kind of well underway. Um, I think what seems to us is not so well underway is that same conversation for research purposes. We, uh, I work in the Chief Privacy Officer, Dorothy, if you haven't met her, the mythical Dorothy now, uh, office, and we spend a lot of time looking at the kind of research that we do at AT&T and make sure it's consistent with our privacy principles and values. And we spend a lot of time talking to folks that also do research in partnership with us and making sure that's true. But to some extent, we're really using our own judgment, that there isn't the same kind of rigor, I think, or agreed upon um, ways to proceed for research purposes. And that was really one of the things we wanted to start to grow in this conversation. And you know, maybe that leads to something more formal, maybe it doesn't, but I think we are interested in, in setting up uh, that conversation and some of those, those structures. And, and the, last, the previous panel was very interesting because it talked about uh, what can be done and kind of technical solutions. And it talked about you know, designing these uh, studies for privacy at the outset. And I think what is, what is then the challenge, if we can agree on that, is that you're asking people whose research expertise is one thing, they're computer scientists, they're city planners, they're sociologists, and you're asking them to design privacy into a research project, which they may be willing to do, but don't know how to do and don't know what that would mean.